Good morning. Welcome to Good to Know Talk Series, where our focus here is to provide financial strategies and tax tips to help grow your business and save on taxes. We understand that business owners are on the move and you need to know how information applies to your personal business. I'm your host, Janine Kong, and owner of Smart Tax and Business Solutions. I am a certified tax strategist and enrolled agent. I help you pay less tax through proactive tax planning. And it looks like we are going to have a new tax bill um, before Christmas. Uh, we just uh, got word that it passed, um, it passed the House and the Senate is expected to vote uh, later tonight. So it's, um, it looks pretty imminent that we're going to have a new tax bill uh, before Christmas. Um, and, and, you know, majority of these changes are actually going to go into effect uh, January 1st, 2018. So that's, that's real quick. Um, so when we come back, you know, after our holiday break, um, you know, tax payers really need to take a look at their tax situation because we're going to be seeing, uh, you know, a lot of changes um, as we are still trying to understand, you know, what every, what is in the bill and just the impact uh, to everybody. But that's what we're working on and we should have some new strategies, um, you know, for our clients uh, come the new year. But, you know, the year isn't quite finished. So I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, some strategies, some deductions that you can still take before the end of the year. Um, and, you know, these are deductions that what happens is, you know, at the end of, uh, during tax season, you know, March and April, my clients will say to me, I didn't know that I could have taken this as deductions. Um, otherwise, I would have saved the receipts. So I wanted to just, you know, talk about it briefly today, just so you know that, you know, you can take these deductions. Um, uh, charitable gifts. Uh, you know, charitable gifts, you know, let you do well for yourself while you do well for others. And there are several ways to write off charitable gifts depending on what you give. And, you know, there's no, there's no dollar limit. However, you can deduct up to 50% of your adjusted gross income for cash gifts that you give to um, 501c3 organizations or public charities. So you're limited to about half of your income um, that you're able to deduct. So public charities, you know, these in also include, you know, churches, uh, symphonies and museums, schools and colleges, um, and then of course traditional charities like United Way and um, you know, American Heart Association. If, if your gifts actually exceed, you know, your adjusted gross income, you know, half of your income in a single year, you can carry forward the excess for up to five years. So keep that in mind when you're, um, you know, donating uh, this year. Uh, if you give to private foundations, you can only deduct 30% of your, of your adjusted gross income. But uh, you can also carry forward any excess for up to five years. Gifts by check are deductible the year you, you write the check, even if it isn't cashed until the next year. Um, and it also applies for credit cards. So you can give via credit card um, as long as it goes through before December 31st, it applies for 2017, even if you don't pay your credit card bill until January of 2018. If you give a single gift of more than $250, you will need a written receipt. Um, um, and you have to make sure you get that receipt before you file your tax return. You can also deduct volunteer expenses as a charitable gift. And when I say volunteer expenses, this includes travel, meals, entertainment, um, anything related to volunteering. And if you wanted to just take the mileage um, and if you're tracking it, um, it's actually 14 cents per mile 
um, or you can keep track of your um, you know, gas and parking that's related to your volunteer activities. You can also deduct any phone calls, you know, cell phone use, um, office supplies, any organizational dues that, um, you know, is required for you to uh, volunteer. And then even uniforms and work clothes, as long as it's not usable as ordinary street clothing. So when you think about like Girl Scout uniforms, this, um, you know, the laundry and the dry cleaning expenses are also deductible. And, you know, don't overlook gifts of property and appreciated assets for valuable deductions. Gifts of clothing, furniture, uh, electronics, household items that are in good condition are deductible at the fair market value. Um, so this is the price that if you were to, you know, sell it online or give it to a, a shop to sell, that's the price, um, you know, that they would sell it. And that's the deduction that you can take. Uh, gifts of life insurance are valued at the policy's cash value. And you can take that deduction. Um, appreciated assets such as securities, uh, even real estate and artwork that you've held for more than a year make great charitable gifts. And you deduct the fair market of the gift. And for real estate and artwork, this is actually the appraised value. And when you think about it, you actually avoid capital gains because if you had to sell your, um, you know, the artwork or sell your real estate, you'd have to pay capital gains tax first and then donate uh, the cash. So it actually makes sense to just give the artwork or real estate um, or securities um, directly to a charity. Uh, meals and entertainment. You know, the basic rule is that you can deduct the cost for meals with um, any cost of meals that have a business purpose. So this means clients, prospects, referral sources, and business colleagues. And, you know, let me ask you, when do you ever eat with someone who's not a client, a prospect, a referral source, or a colleague. If you're in a business like real estate, insurance, or investments, where you're marketing yourself, the answer might be never. So be as, be as aggressive as you can with what you define as a business deduction. The general rule is you can deduct 50% of your meals entertainment. So, so long as it isn't lavish or ex extraordinary. Um, you know, the IRS knows you have to eat. So you can't deduct it all, but they'll meet you halfway. Uh, if any of you entertain at home, uh, do you ever discuss business? Are you deducting those meals too? There's no requirement that you actually have to eat out. Um, and you know, don't forget you can deduct home entertainment expenses too. Uh, you can deduct entertainment expenses if they take place directly before or after your business discussion. So you can deduct, um, you know, if you have a business meeting and then you decide to go to a sporting event, then you can deduct the value of those tickets for the sporting event um, and the meals um, and the parking that went along with um, the event. You don't need to keep receipts for expenses under $75 but you do need to record the five pieces of information, such as how much, uh, when this event happened, where this event happened, the business purpose of this event, um, and then also the business relationship uh, with the people um, that were there with you. The IRS wants to know how much you paid for the meal, um, and, you know, and if you, so if you have it, if you pay by credit card and you have, you know, it lists the vendor statement and the date, um, you know, a lot of this information is already on your credit card statement. So you would just need to add, you know, what the business purpose was and, you know, who you're with and, and how you know them um, in relation to business. Uh, 
Um, fringe benefits. You know, I mentioned this because, again, you know, clients often say to me after the fact that they didn't know that they could deduct this. So save your receipts. You can, um, you know, you can pay your employees a length of service award of up to $400 in property. Now you can't give them cash, but you can actually give this to them every five years. So if you haven't done it yet, you know, this Christmas might be a good time to, to give them, you know, up to $400 um, in an award. Um, it can be, uh, you know, things like an iPad or, you know, a new cell phone, you know, things like that, and you can deduct it. Um, there's also um, de minimis fringe benefits. So, you know, meals, transportation that you're paying for your employees when they work late, um, you know, any type of, you know, picnics or, uh, you know, cocktail parties that you might have. If you've given any type of birthday gifts for your employees, um, or given them any type of sporting event, you know, tickets, also coffee, juice, donuts that you provide at the office. And then, you know, even flowers, books that you might give to your employees just out of um, whether it's a family situation that might have come out, come up, um, you know, so out of sympathy or just as a, you know, just being a great boss. <laughs> so all of these, you know, I'm, I'm figuring that you probably already spent money on these items. So, you know, keep, go back and find those receipts because you can definitely deduct it, um, you know, for 2017. Home office expenses. And, you know, the home office deduction is probably the most misunderstood deduction in the entire tax code. And for years, taxpayers feared it raised an automatic audit flag. But, you know, Congress has actually relaxed the rules, so it's now far less likely to attract attention. And how do you qualify for home office? Here's the language. You, your home office needs to be used exclusively and regularly for administrative or management activities of your trade or business. And you have no other location where you conduct administrative or management activities. So you can have another office, but if your home office is a place where you do most of your administrative and management activities, then your home office qualifies. So if you have another office, but it's at home that you manage your staff, you pay your bills, maybe you send out your invoices, then you qualify for performing majority of your administrative activities in your home office. Now, when it says regularly and exclusively, so regularly means about 10 to 12 hours uh, per week. So in order to prove your deduction, you know, make sure you keep a log. Um, I would also recommend taking photos of your, you know, of your office space at home. And you can claim whether it's a, its own room or just the space that you use for business. It doesn't have to be an entirely separate room used only for business in your house. And the first thing you're going to do is determine the percentage of your house that you're using for business. And then after that, you'll, based on that percentage, you're able to deduct a portion of your rent, uh, your mortgage interest, property taxes. If you own your home, you can even depreciate um, a, part of, a part of your home. Um, you can deduct the percentage of utilities any insurance uh, security for your home. And, um, you know, and the one thing that taxpayers often forget about is once you start claiming a home office, it actually boosts your car deductions because now you don't have the commuting miles. So every time you go from home to your other office, that counts as, uh, as business miles. So that's a that's an added, uh, an added perk.
Oh, lastly, I want to mention, you know, I want to talk about family employment. Now, you can't go back um, and, you know, try to create these deductions. But business owners often tell me that their kids are already helping in the business. So, um, you know, you can, you can hire your family. There is a minimum age, uh, for now at least. They have to be at least seven years old. And, you know, I've seen recommendations that you can hire your younger children to serve as models for advertising, but I'm not aware of this particular strategy, um, you know, being blessed by the IRS or the tax courts. So the first uh, $6,300 of income that you pay to your kids uh, is, is taxed at zero. And this is because it's the standard deduction. So you can pay each child uh, up to $6,300 per year and it's tax free. You do have to pay them a reasonable wage for the service they perform. And the tax court says a reasonable wage is what you would pay a commercial vendor for the same service. So if your 12 year old son, for example, cuts grass for your rental properties, then pay him what a landscaping service might charge. If your 15 year old helps keep your books, then pay him, you know, a little bit less than a bookkeeping service might charge. And, you know, does anyone have a teenager who helps with your website? What would you pay a commercial designer for that service? To audit proof your return, you want to make sure you write out a job description and, you know, there's a timesheet showing the hours and the dates that they worked. And make sure you pay them by check so you can, you know, of course, document these payments. And you do have to deposit the check into an account in the child's name. Now, it doesn't have to be just a, you know, video game slush fund. It can be a Roth IRA for, so they have, um, you know, tax-free growth for the next several decades. It can even be a Section 529 college savings plan or a custodial account that you can control until they're 21. Um, and this would be something, you know, a great conversation to have with James Cobb. Um, and he can help, you know, direct you with the different options to set up for your kids. And now you can't use money in a custodial account for your basic obligations as a parent, you know, like food and, um, you know, the roof over your head. But things like private school are not considered an obligation you know, or basic parent support. So uh, even, you know, summer camp. Um, so let's say your teenage daughter wants to spend two weeks, you know, at a, a summer camp. You can either earn the fee yourself, pay tax on it, and then pay for the summer camp with after-tax dollars. Or you can pay your daughter to work in your business deposit that check into her custodial account. And then when it comes time to pay for the camp, you write a check from her custodial account to pay for the camp. So basically this way you're paying for the summer camp that normally wouldn't be deductible. You're now able to write it off as a business expense. And if you are a sole proprietorship, you don't, you don't have to withhold Social Security, um, you know, for your ch child's pay uh, until they turn 18. So this really is tax-free money. Um, and, you know, if, if you're in a situation where you already have your kids, um, you know, working for you in the business, then please, you know, reach out to me before the end of the year and we can make sure we get the paperwork all lined up so that you can take this deduction uh, for 2017. Um, you know, and it, that's, that's pretty much it in terms of just in the last, you know, less than two weeks we have to the end of the year. Um, and I also want to remind our listeners, if you have a SEP IRA or a 401k, 
you know, already open as of December 31st, you can still contribute to the SEP IRA and to your 401k by, you can contribute as late as April 15 when your tax returns are due to still have it apply for 2017. Um, I, that's all I have for everyone today. If there's any questions, I can take questions. But I want to just wish everybody, you know, just a Merry Christmas. If you're doing any traveling in the next couple of weeks, uh, please, you know, travel safe. We will be taking a break the next two weeks and we will return on January 9th um, at 10 a.m. And we look forward to the new year. Um, if, um, if there's any questions that you have, you can always you know, email us at info at smarttaxhawaii.com. And please like and follow us on social media. And we look forward to the new year with everyone. Thank you very much.